Hi everyone and welcome back to the OWASP Top 10 tutorial series and in this series I've been explaining what each of these top 10 web application vulnerabilities are and number 9, uh, number A9 from the 2013 list is called Components with Known Vulnerabilities and probably like you would expect uh, most of us use different components in our web application to provide you know the functionality and we do that because we don't all want to reinvent every single thing that we need and the chances are that somebody else has done a job better than we would do which is why we like to reuse things but it's not always easy to know whether these other components contain vulnerabilities themselves either just in general or maybe in a particular configuration so maybe if they're used in a specific way they might create a vulnerability in our web application so these third-party components can add vulnerabilities and that could be anything from obviously very subtle small vulnerabilities right through to major kind of more serious ones as well and it's worth mentioning as well that the uh, components that we use will exist at different levels in our stack. So obviously we use some in our web applications, but we might have third party components in our database, in our operating system, uh, any kind of parts of the web server, load balancers, network hardware. Uh, components kind of exist at all different levels and we need to make sure that we are um, thinking about these components so most applications probably have a number of vulnerabilities but in many cases these will either be impossible to attack because of other controls that are in place or maybe the specific configuration that we've used means that uh, it can't be taken advantage of and so you might have something like a vulnerability in OpenSSL, but maybe it only exists in SSL version 3 and we only use TLS, for instance. So our particular configuration might mean that the vulnerability is not actually exposed to an attacker. But also most of the major vulnerabilities tend to be well known and they do become news stories. So most of you have probably heard of things like you know, heart bleed and, you know, some of the other open SSL vulnerabilities that have come out, they kind of make the news. And so it's quite easy to find out about them. But unfortunately, lots of vulnerabilities uh, are not quite so well known. They are maybe not reported. They are discovered all the time in lots of different um, components. And of course, there's still a certain amount of pride, which means that if my component has a vulnerability, then I don't necessarily want to tell everybody about it because I'm a bit worried that people won't use my component or they won't pay me for it or whatever. Um, and of course, the other reality is that lots of people just don't do enough testing on their components to find these things out. So even with OpenSSL, where the uh, Heartbleed bug was caused by a, a change, a code change that had been made many, many years ago, but because of the nature and complexity of something like OpenSSL, uh, nobody spotted it for a long time, uh, which might be good, it might be bad. But usually when these things do finally get found out, then um, there are various channels um, that they come through. Now, when it comes to fixing it, one of the real difficulties uh, with this whole uh, vulnerability, A9, is that there is no kind of one straight answer to how you need to manage it. Really what we're talking about is configuration and, and change management, basically. So we're talking about having some kind of process that allows us both to reduce the number of components that we use, uh, and that might be removing things that are just not used. So maybe it was added at one point, but we never called any of the functionality. So we should consider removing those things. But maybe we use uh, 10 different types of, um, I don't know, image resizing. And maybe we could just use one uh, to, to, to do all of it. So again, we reduce the chance of an exposure. We might all also consider using components that might be slightly less functional because we already use them rather than kind of buying in a new component just because it's slightly better or slightly faster. We have to be quite uh, practical 
with uh, how we make these decisions. And the whole kind of area of configuration and change control, it's something that, again, we don't really like doing. We're not usually very good at it in software development, sadly. In bigger companies, they tend to have, you know, whole teams of people who just look after it. Because if I asked you to name all of the versions of all of the components that are used in your entire web application stack, most of you probably wouldn't be able to tell me and for some of you, you wouldn't even know how to how to answer that question. So the configuration control can be quite tricky, but it's really, really important that you know what versions of things you are using, because if you find out that there is a vulnerability in version, I don't know, X, Y, Z of one of your components, then you don't want to have to look through, you know, 200 different web applications to find out if any of them are using the vulnerable version. You kind of should already be able to know that from your configuration and change control. So that's uh, kind of in terms of how you do it. It's really just a case of, of, of process and things like that. But one of the really difficult parts is keeping up with updates, with security updates, with um, security advisories that come out for certain components. So if it's something really widely used, like a, the Apache web server or OpenSSL or something like that, then probably you'll you'll hear the advisory come out. They're on most of the kind of technology websites. They come out fairly readily. But of course, for the smaller components, you're uh, you know going to need some kind of discipline in that. Uh, and it might mean something like paying for a support contract on a component that doesn't cost any money just so that you will get security advisories that come through if the manufacturer realizes that there's something broken in their code you get an email you can deal with it straight away rather than hopefully trying to find out about it uh, on a news website so keep it on top of updates again there's no one right answer to do that um, except to kind of be making sure that somebody who's responsible for this is spending up enough time on the news sites, you know, Hacker News, The Register, or whatever it is that you use, uh, and, and finding out about these things. Uh, another resource that you can use is a lot of penetration testing companies have various sorts of scanners. And what the scanners do is they scan your system looking for version numbers. So they might scan your web server, find a version of Apache, a version of OpenSSL. Uh, and interestingly, uh, you get some pen testing companies will tell you to hide the version numbers in order to provide extra security. And this is one example where that is probably not very good advice because doing that means that these scanning tools are not going to be able to find versions of software which they can then use to look up in the CVE, which is the uh, Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures database to look for known vulnerabilities. Whereas if your web server exposes your version of Apache, OpenSSL, whatever whatever uh, modules you've got loaded, then these scanning tools work really well, really quickly. And they can basically say, yes, here's three things that you need to update or here are three things you need to know about, even if there is no update available, which gives you the ability to make a decision on that, a risk decision. Do I accept that vulnerability which hasn't been patched yet or do I need to add another system, a firewall, uh, a different web server, whatever it is to kind of mitigate against that risk. And the last thing really is, you know, something that's really important and what a lot of larger companies really fail on is you absolutely must have a process to make urgent updates to your system. So if you, uh, I don't know, somebody turned around and said, oh, we've just realized that Apache has got this massive vulnerability in it. Uh, what you can't afford to do is wait six months for your normal software release process to go through the motions to get that fix all the way through. You absolutely need to have the ability to say this is uh, an urgent fix that needs to be made against the current code base. So we can't put a load of defect fixes in with it, which risk breaking a load of other things. We need to put this into the current code base, deploy it immediately and do that in parallel with our normal development process. So again, there's um, scope there for having that as part of your general software development process, your software management, your change control is how you can make urgent updates. So not really very much um, information I can give you. I mean, I can show you very quickly 
the the CV database which is held at mitre.org so you've got all kinds of stuff in here you can search for particular modules like so if you search for say uh, Apache 2 or something here's all of the vulnerabilities that people have listed for Apache 2 um, you, these are kind of not massively usable without one of these scanning tools because at the minute you're kind of looking down you've got different versions you've got different distributions so you know these may or may not be relevant you might or might not use mod rivet for example so just in a normal sense this is really quite a pretty much a thin shell on top of a database but using either a company to do it for you or one of the off the shelf kind of scanning tools you'll have to google for them uh, you will find um, that these this data is actually more usable when it's got uh, some more, kind of more concrete recommendations but yeah i guess the, the take home things from a9 is basically again have a process think about some of these scenarios before they happen make sure that you do have a way to make updates make sure you know what your current configuration is because you can't make an update to something if you don't have the ability to grab the current code base in order to make the change. If you're the kind of person who's always deploying things on top of stuff um, so that you end up losing your code base in amongst all your changes, then that kind of thing is very difficult and you might need to change things around to make it a bit more easy, easy for you to do. But otherwise, you need to make sure you've got somebody who's responsible for this. You need management to buy into it so that you don't end up like some of these large companies who have software that's 10 years old running on ancient versions that are full of holes just because you don't know what versions you're running and the first time you find out is when an attacker gets into your system um, and ends up stealing something or breaking something but um, that's kind of all there is that I can really say about it there's a whole load of stuff you can do on it there are a whole load of kind of companies that offer these sorts of services in terms of vulnerable components you can do your homework as well so if you don't use too many modules you could actually search for them all on the cv database you could contact the manufacturer of that and ask them if they have a place where they keep their vulnerability list so you can check it regularly you need to be looking at new sites just doing all the usual stuff to make sure that you've carried out an amount of due diligence on your website so any further questions uh, anything that you want more detail on please put it in the comments uh, under the video otherwise i will see you in a10 which is our last vulnerability which is about unvalidated redirects and forwards